Welcome everybody, Don Gennetti, lighting-essentials.com and project52prosystem.com. I'm joined today by Dennis Dunbar of Dunbar Digital, a digital retouching company in Los Angeles. And uh, Dennis, it's great to have you here. Great to join you. So you are, were you at one time a photographer? I started out uh, in photography. Um, studied, I was telling somebody about this earlier this week. I studied engineering in college. And I found I was taking every class except engineering. Kind of tell myself I didn't want to be an engineer. And at the same time, I got swept up into photography. It became like, oh, this is a really cool thing. I had a lot of fun. And as I was trying to learn about that, I uh, got connected and I started working at a place to run a photo equipment in LA. I was, uh, this was the late 80s. It was called Arena's PRS, Photographic Rental Service. And from there, I learned a ton about photography. Started, when I left there, I worked as a photo assistant, assisting advertising photographers on their uh, various shoots. And at the same time, I started hearing more and more about this coming wave of, of retouching, digital imaging. And uh, that became the thing I was completely compelled to do. So I started out with a background in photography uh, and then wound up just getting swept up in retouching and became the thing I was called to do. Now, do you, um, you were mentioning being a, an assistant. You are, I want to make sure everybody is clear on this. You are a retoucher, not a digital tech. Correct. So you get the, you get the work at the end of the, at the end of the deal. The digital tech is on set with the shoot happening. Right, right. When I started out, there were no such thing as digital techs because everything was film based. You were just retouching on, on, uh, Traditional at that point? No, um, this was, I started retouching around 1990, 91. 91 was when I, just about uh, February 91 was when I got my first computer and officially opened my doors as a, as a retouching business. Um, and in those days, everything was shot on film. So the first step was to get it scanned. So you'd get it scanned at, at a service bureau you pay a boatload of money for a drum scan, a high-end scan, and then you'd retouch it on your computer, give it back to the service bureau, and they would run it through a process and output a uh, transparency at the end, and that would be your final product. And, um, I mean, I, I had a computer in 1990, um, and I'm thinking of some of the file sizes I have today. Um, <laughs> that would have been really interesting. <laughs> so. How did you, what were you using at the time to handle those big, you had to be dealing with the, well, how big were the files? Or 500 megabytes or? No, no, the, the files, you had a, um, most of the time the, the way you would transport the files back and forth was on a, a thing called a SyQuest disk. I have a whole box of them in the garage. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it started out, they were like 40 megabyte capacity. So your scan had to fit on that. Sometimes you play a trick where where the service bureau would like, oh, here's a way we can span it across two disks and write your scan to two disks. But that was, you know, the, the limit was what you had to, to move the data around on. And then when you start working on Photoshop, didn't have any layers those days. So you'd open up your, your uh, scan and uh, You'd always be working on it more or less destructively because you, you know, they had no choice. That's right. Or so um, you can scale things up in in Photoshop, but you didn't do that a whole lot back then. So the file size, I don't remember the file sizes getting that big. It was enough. I think a four by five scan um, was like 140 megabytes, I think. Does that sound right? It sounds about that right. Yeah. It, would, it would depend. When you get it scanned, you'd figure out what your output was going to be and what the use was going to be. And then you tell them, like, oh, give me, you know, so many pixel scan for it. So they'd scan at different resolutions or whatever um, for that. And I remember back in the very early days, uh, Jeff Shuey, who uh, was a photographer based in the Chicago area, and he made 
quite a name for himself. He got really uh, involved with Adobe and all that early on. Um, he was famous for uh, saying it had to be 300 megabytes. That was, you know, what film resolution was. Well, it turned out sure he was saying that because he had got a computer from Apple that would handle that. And he figured that was the size his clients couldn't handle. So it made them come to him for all their work. <laughs> <laughs> well. And now, and now you just laugh at the numbers we thought were big back then. Because, you know, um, last October I was working on uh, at one of the movie poster places. And some of the files were like 30 gigabytes with for a movie poster or billboard thing. And with all the layers and stuff like that, just ridiculous sizes. So you think now, like, yeah, I used to think 300 megabytes was huge. <laughs> my very first computer was a Mac Plus. Uh, uh, my, mine was a uh, Wicked Fast 2FX. Ah, and that little black and white screen about yay big? No, it had, it had a color screen. Yeah, no, mine had black and white. And um, I remember uh, I saved up a boatload of money because it was over $1,000. Oh, yeah. I went down to the local place here and bought a, a hard drive, a little pizza box hard drive that the Mac Plus would sit on. And I paid about a thousand or eleven hundred bucks for it. It was twenty megabytes. Oh yeah. And I remember my friend standing there looking at it, going, "Dude, you'll never fill that up." <laughs> my how times have changed. Yeah, I think my first hard drive was like 600 megabytes. And you go to a user group meeting and you say, I got 128K of memory and, and a 600 megabyte hard drive and, and you were God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We and then a friend of mine, eventually, a photographer friend of mine, eventually bought a, a, a two gigabyte RAID when he uh, started working on stuff five, six years later. And I'm like, William, what, what in heaven's name are you going to do with two gigabytes? <laughs> I just have to laugh now. You know, your thumb drive is six oh, yeah. gigabytes. Yeah, exactly. You get two gigabytes of crap you downloaded off the internet last week. So yeah, yeah it's really really crazy. Um, what uh, you work with some uh, big time photographers in LA, but you work with photographers all over the country, correct? Yeah, I do. And what? Um, how do they? What I think the guys want to know from my Project 52 folks and Lighting Essentials is, how does a photographer approach a digital uh, retoucher? And what do they tell you? I mean, I mean, you're not just gonna go take the image and go and do stuff to it. They need to okay. tell you what needs to be done and you need to, it's a back and forth, correct? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That way, that's what makes it work best. You know, really, I look at it like this. The retoucher's job is to help the photographer or the end client realize their vision. So I have to figure out what it is they want to do. So it's not me imposing my ideas on, on them. It's trying to figure out what, they're, what they want and then how to make that happen. So the more communication you get, the, the better. You know, it, the dangerous times when the photographer sends you stuff like, you know, a shot of an actress, just make her look beautiful, give her perfect skin. And you have no idea what they mean by perfect skin because everybody uses the same term. Yeah. <laughs> like, like I, yeah. So, so the clearer they can be with what they're looking for, the easier it is to figure out how to get it is how to get what they want. Dennis, make it look more, you know, New York urban. <laughs> oh. I, I have I have one movie poster uh, client. I've been working with this guy, gosh, for for a few decades now. And uh, he was famous for it. It, it needs more magic. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> like, what in heaven's name is magic? And you know, just tell me where that button is, and I'll hit as many times as you want. Yep, yep. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what I want, but I'll know it when I see it. Yeah, yeah, that always works. <laughs> yeah, th those, are, those are the times that there's a, uh, there's a uh, photographer. Um, he works in another profession. So photography is more like his passion. Uh, it's not a professional photographer. And I'm doing working on black and white conversions for him. And that's one of those cases where he sends me some examples. I think I've got it nailed. Like, no, no, it's looking too gritty. I want it more delicate. Like, well, you sent me stuff with really dramatic, strong blacks. 
and highlights. <laughs> it's like, so figuring out what it is he wants and how to get that is, is the hard part. Yep. Yep. Um, your, your uh, clients, they send you a transparent, I mean, not a transparent, they send you a digital file. Mm -hmm. do, do they usually mark it up for you? Or are they giving you a, like a, a TIFF file with some markings on it? Or are they giving you a print with markings on it? Or how does that, how's that work uh, generally? Yeah, that, that comes in a variety of ways. Um, like uh, one, one guy uh, who shoots a lot of product stuff, uh, Hunter Freeman, he's based up in the San Francisco area. Mm -hmm. A really nice guy and a great photographer. Uh, like if he's shooting a watch, um, he'll send me a folder full of images of the watch, shots, he, you know, frames he took of the watch. And then we'll get on the phone and we'll talk about it. And he'll say like, okay, you know, this is the one I'm singing with for the base shot. This one's going to be for the highlight, you know, over here. And this one will be for the strap. And I'm like, okay, you know, we get the plan. Uh, another photographer uh, who also shoots a lot of product stuff. He's based up in Portland, a guy, Michael Jones. Um, sometimes what he does is he just roughly layers the stuff in for me. So I get a photo, I get all the tiffs, but I also get a Photoshop file that gives me a really rough idea of what he's thinking. Like, oh, this shot for the highlight on the side, this one for the, for the neck of the wine bottle. Got it. All right. Um, so sometimes it's that. Sometimes I get uh, a JPEG with, markups all over it. Uh, and then occasionally from like ad agencies, they like to uh, produce these elaborate decks, they call them. I never quite figured out how deck came to be the term, but it's a PDF with all these pages and stuff. And they get really detail oriented about, about outlining all this stuff. And you have to sift through 20 pages to, of details to figure out what it is they're looking for. I think that came from, um, Back in the in the in the day, early days of Apple, remember um, slide decks? Oh yeah, I think it was slide deck, right? Was was it called something like that? And then it the the term starts getting used for PowerPoint presentations are decks. Um, yeah. So yeah, so they're calling a, a basically it's a document is what it is a retouching document. They're calling it a deck. Hmm, it's interesting. Yeah, I think that, I think they use the uh, uh, deck of cards analogy. Yeah. Maybe that's where it came from. I don't yeah. remember. I don't remember what that what that thing was, but I remember it was something like uh, hypercard. Hypercard. Yeah. Hypercard. That's what it was. Yep. Hypercard. Yeah. Well, that's that's cool. Um, how do you and the photographers uh, communicate? Is it Skype, uh, text, email? Um, most of the time, it most of the the. Uh, Communication will be through uh, through email, um, marking up JPEGs. You know, so um, what will typically happen is like if it's a, a lifestyle shot, photographer might say, you know, oh, there are a few things here we have some issues with, um, and this stuff in the background, this bright blue sign is a little distracting. Can you tone it down or get rid of it or whatever? So I'll do a first pass, go through and all the stuff I'm pretty sure they want and all the stuff I think should be done. Send them a JPEG and say, you know, here, here's a first pass. Looking for your feedback. And they'll come back like, oh, this looks really great. Can you, you know, lighten the lines under her eyes a little bit more? Or can you bring back this highlight some more? And we do a few rounds like that. That's cool. Um, why does a photographer, I'm playing devil's advocate here, why does a photographer send their work out to a retoucher instead of just doing it themselves? Well, there's a variety of reasons for it. The uh, biggest reason is um, most photographers have focused on learning photography, not retouching. So they're not as good at retouching. Uh, the other aspect is um, what are you getting paid the most to focus your time on? Photographers getting paid the most to focus their time on shooting and creating cool images. And so, you know, you get your creative fee for that. And then you're spending twice as much time on the stuff you get paid very little time on, you know, doing the uh, retouching yeah. stuff. Yeah. So it's like they can get that off their plate, focus on the, on the stuff they make a bigger profit on while still having control over it by working with somebody else. And, um, 
most of the time the your fee is passed through, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, most of the, most of the time it's a there's a separate budget. It's you know, the same thing as like, you know, you're charging for an assistant or a stylist or a makeup artist. Mm -hmm. You know, you just tell the client, this is what the fee for the makeup artist is going to be. And the client, okay, that's part of the budget, we pay it. So it's not really, you know, it's not really looking like it's coming out of the photographer's fee. Right. But, you know, there are, there's a variety of ways clients work. Sometimes they say, you know, we had X number of dollars for a job. Make it happen. Whatever's left over is what you get to keep. So, you know, sometimes it works out that way for photographer. Well, I know that um, I think photographers as a group, I think we spend too much damn time in the chair anyway. Getting, you know, getting out of the chair and, and you know, even if you're spending your time marketing, it's better than sitting and retouching. Uh, <laughs> and even, and it's interesting, even photographers that I know of that have very Photoshop involved style, and that their work is very, you know, it's Photoshop. There's, you know, they're shooting this person in the studio and, you know, even they have separate retouchers. Most of them, the working oh, yeah. commercials, photographers uh, that do that, they're not sitting doing that late into the evening. They've got, A, they've got a life, and B, they've got a business to run. And, right, and, and, you know, there, there are, on Facebook, I see, participate in a lot of uh, different Facebook groups and stuff. And there are a lot of uh, people, their careers aren't quite as advanced as like getting up into the advertising side mm -hmm. yet or whatever. So they're, you know, a little, um, uh, what would be the best term? A little younger in their career. Sure. So not young people, but a little bit younger in their career. And sure. they're like, oh my God, you know, I'm spending 20 hours a day on this stuff. I shoot a thing and then I have to spend 12 hours retouching it. I don't have time for anything. Like, well, what you're probably running into is, is you have too much on your plate and it's keeping you from advancing. So if you can offload some of that stuff for that, you can yep. you can focus on getting the higher paying jobs. Yeah. You know, all your time, you know, cleaning up all the little stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Of course the other the other side of the coin is it's more fun to play in Photoshop than it is to actually get out there and find clients. <laughs> well yeah, there, there I, I understand Unfortunately I, I, I see I see you post the stuff about about uh, reaching out to like three people a day. Yep. Like, yeah, I should. And then like a whole week goes by like, yeah, how come I only reached out to like two? Well, I, and, and there's and something scary about it and everything else becomes more interesting than, than doing the work you need to be doing. Oh well, yeah, so it's the writer who has to make sure all the pencils are sharpened before they could ever consider writing. And once the pencils are sharpened, then the office isn't clean enough and you can't clean the office unless you do the dishes in vacuum. And then where did the day go? Yeah, um, yeah. Video, well, I don't know if you saw the video on how just how long it takes to do three contacts a day. Less than five minutes. <laughs> so when someone tells me I don't have time, I go, mm, no, that one isn't going to work for me. Yeah, yeah. It's not a matter of time. It's, it's cool. finding that elusive thing called focus. Yeah. That's one, and one of the reasons why I'm a, you know, I used to talk a lot about goals. I used to do like some, a, a bit of, um, what do you call it, the motivational speaking and stuff, and we talk about goals and how important it is. And I'm, I've really come to realize that goals aren't really as important as a system is. If you have a system, you can get things done. Goals are those things that you can, you know, mow the lawn and wash the dishes and still have goals. You know, your goals are always out there. You're not doing anything with their goals are always out there. Well, that's a waste of time. What's important is what's your system? Get up. Do this at 10 o'clock, you stop, and for five or 10 minutes, you make three contacts that day, and then you move on. Or you do it just before lunch or whatever. But the systemized approach gets action happening. But uh, yeah, three a day, five a day if you're really, really ambitious. Four a day doesn't work. I hate even numbers. It's just, you do four a day, you're down the tubes. Sorry. Just, just the way it is. It's numerology, folks. Let's yeah. look at some of your photographs here, sir. Sure. All right. Handsome looking website. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> where do you want to start? Uh, gosh, well, 
Uh, people love the movie poster stuff, so you can click on the entertainment one. I just got. I just finally got permission to add a bunch of stuff I worked on last year. Now these are probably um, very complex. Oh yeah. Files, instructions for you, etc. Yeah, well, the, the trick. I was just telling somebody the uh, the one with Jack Black mm -hmm. on the uh, on the right there. Um, I was just talking with somebody about this. Uh, that one was was really interesting. Not only do we have, you know, all the stuff building the cave that he's in and adding the light, and there was all these spiders and snakes and stuff being added in, and then lots of stuff about what the background should be. But the shot of Jack himself was hacked together from a couple of different set shots. So they had one, I, I guess he's running through the jungle. So they had the upper body was one shot and then the legs were another shot. And it wasn't really, uh, none of it was sharp or focused very well. So it's sort of a underexposed, grainy. Oh my. Shot. And that was the pose that the studio picked. Not, not the design agency. The design agency had all these stuff where they brought the actors into a studio and photographed them in a high-res camera and got great files. The studio didn't want any of those. Like, no, no, no. We like that pose of, of Jack for this poster. So it goes through a long process getting this stuff approved. And when it finally got approved, you're like, okay, now we have to take this really crappy source material and make it look decent. And so what I was doing to um, to bring that in, like if you if you click on the uh, poster of Jack and see it bigger, uh, if you can see his face, like for the uh, for the face, what I was having to do for that was um, uh, look through the special shoot stuff they had done in studio where we had nice detail and find oh here's the side of his cheek that looks like it's about the same, you know, pretty close to the same pose. I can take that and use a blending mode to overlay and, and make it look like his beard has detail in it. So I did that for the cheek, for the mustache, and then each lens of the glass was brought in from a separate frame because like, okay, this one kind of matches up. I can warp a little bit and use a blending mode to make it look like there's detail in the frame around his hand holding the torch. That was a blurry mess, so we found a hand that was similar and just brought in the lines for the hand to uh, to make it look like he had detail in the fist. So that's what a lot of the uh, stuff is. And of course, I'm not allowed to show any of the original work for it. For it. it took long enough just to get permission just to show the end product for it. So but that's what makes working on the movie poster stuff interesting. I don't do the design. The designers at the agency go through that process, and that can take months or even a year or so to finally get approval on a uh, on a final design now do they keep coming back to you during that time or they they design it for they in this particular case they can't really design it first because you've got to put all those pictures together to get him right well they they their designers are pretty good at photoshop but they have to work fast so they they put all that stuff together they, they okay. do that they do that design themselves and they knew in this case like okay that shot of Jack, like, we don't know, you know, what pose they're going to go for or whatever. And, you know, this was, uh, I don't know how they wound up with that particular one for it. But, um, you know, they slapped it together and like, okay, I don't know how you can make this work. But, <laughs> you know, here's the stuff you got to make work. And some of the designers have a good file structure, so it's pretty easy to follow what they did. And others, they have stuff scattered all over the place. One of the guys who worked there uh, creates this beautiful imagery, but like if you uh, look where the spider is on the uh, on the left, yeah. on the vines, he'll have the vines and like four or five layers for the vines scattered throughout his layer stack. The spider will be somewhere mixed in the middle of that and figure out, I just need to move the spider and the vines to the left a little bit, <laughs> figure out how to make that happen. Sometimes it'd be really complicated. Wow. So. Let me ask you this. Um, did, did you have to build anything other than assemble? Did you, or did you create rocks or 
or ferns or anything like that? Or are these uh, all separate the stuff, images? The stuff, the stuff it, where you see the background through the opening, um, they had a jungle scene back there, but then they were like, oh, we're having problems. We don't like what's over here. So sometimes they kind of mean like, hey, you know, this would be one I'm working in house uh, for them. And they'll say, oh, while we're waiting for this, can you uh, find a solution for this thing in the background or whatever? So sometimes the clients will ask me to kind of get involved and help solve problems in their, uh, in the design process. And then other times it's, this has been approved, just rebuild it, make it look perfect. You know, so it, it's a variety of things. It's always kind of fun when you get to uh, get involved in the design process. There was some, there was something else for this uh, Jumanji movie that I didn't get to uh, show that was uh, more of a horizontal ad. And it was, uh, it could be used for, um, they were calling it a digital ad. So I guess it was gonna be used on a website or something. And it was gonna be interactive. You clicked on this or that. And they had a rough design. And over the time, like, oh, you know, the client wants to see some, some eyes glowing in the ferns over here. Can you figure out how to add that? And the altar thing they're standing on is too big. Can you carve away some of the back and figure out how to bring the rhinos closer and stuff? So there were things like that going on, which was kind of fun. You know, it's always, uh, it's fun when you get involved in that, especially if it's in a uh, situation where they're supportive about it and understanding, you know, like, okay, this is going to be an exploration process rather than, First thing we see, it has to look golden. That's cool. That's cool. How many different photographers involved in the the these four posters here for Jumanji? Uh, well, let's say there'd be set photographer or photographers. I, I don't really know about that. The ad agencies that do movie poster stuff don't hire a lot of photographers themselves. Um, they had the, so the studios, when they're shooting the movie, will have a set photographer that shoots a lot of stuff. And then uh, they'll have um, a uh, photographer do what they call a special shoot. And the photographer will take the main actors into the studio and shoot them in a variety of poses. Uh, sometimes with props and sometimes just in a variety of poses. And then the studio will distribute that to the different agencies working on the campaign. So several agencies will be working on the same campaign for the stuff. So um, this, these things that you're seeing here were, were done by an agency called The Refinery. Uh, really nice people there. Other ones for Jumanji were done by Bond, uh, which is another really cool agency. So, you know, it, it'll, it'll be sometimes four or five different agencies working on the same campaigns. And they each get to do a little part of it sometimes. Very interesting. Really interesting. Ooh, these are new. Yeah, yeah, this was also done when I was working at Refinery. Um, two things for uh, all I see are you. Um, I really like the one with the uh, ink stuff in the eye. Yeah, me too. And uh, that was fun. But the, the thing with that was um, evidently there's a, a group that the same group that provides the uh, ratings for the movies you know those that are rated or pg rated right they approve the artwork as well and so for the eye stuff it was like had to walk that balance between it couldn't look like a bloody eye <laughs> so originally it had a lot of red around there which looked really cool but the mpaa or whoever was the rating people they were like no no it looks too bloody so it was dancing around a lot, trying to find the right coloration and, and the right amount of, of ink drips or whatever to add without crossing a line. Wow. You did um, one that, yeah, you did the Will Smith I Am Legend. Yeah, well, that, that was, yeah, that was one of many uh, I Am Legend posters. That was from quite a while ago. Yeah, it was a- 2007, so 11 years ago. Yeah, and I I really like that poster series. Is, is this the only one you did, or did several people do them? Or because this is my favorite one from that. that oh, series. well, cool. Um, this was this was at a agency called BLT, uh, and they're probably one of the biggest in terms of doing movie posters. Uh, and uh, 
so they had there were several variations on this with different actors and stuff so i was one of a group working on this one and this one the heart the the hardest part was building the background all those uh buildings going there because the art director had just slapped it together with a bunch of different set shots all from different perspectives so you're having to go in and, and tweak each building to try to make the perspective lines match and then there was a lot of stuff you had to retouch out from from around there so uh you know getting rid of cars parked on the street and all that uh and then adding in the destruction that they wanted it to look like it was destroyed and making that perspectives match because the art director moving quickly you know like okay here we'll just make it look sort of okay and get their approval and then we'll give it somebody else to figure out how to make it all work right very that's very cool that's very cool thank you let's go up and look at um some before and afters oh yeah yeah we, we gotta we gotta update these <laughs> I will, as soon as this is over, I will keep you on and show you. Okay. This is fascinating to me because, um, and it's funny when I look at it because I worked with a photographer as an assistant way back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we were shooting for Japan Airlines and we had to build a, uh, build a set that looked like an airplane because we didn't have no Photoshop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, had to, we had to basically build a, a part of this structure here and then the back wall and they brought in the seats from Japan Airlines. It was, you know, it took us a week to build the set and, wow. and light it. And, um, you know, shot on Kodachrome 25, um, and <laughs> delivered as a slide, you know, and now they can, they're doing all this kind of stuff. So this was actually just built in a studio. Um, right. it's like a pair of hands over here holding this up it's a clamp, obviously. Um, but very cool. And then you come in and you do all the amazing magic here. Yeah. Yeah. Th th this was a fun project. This was one of a, several different images worked on for that series. Uh, photographer was this guy, Gil Cope. And he does a lot of uh, commercials as well. Uh, but occasionally he would get asked when he's shooting a commercial to do the steel campaign. For it. So uh, this was for the rollout of the 787 plane for Boeing. And uh, he figured he couldn't get a slice in the way he wanted inside the actual fuselage of the plane. Can't light it like this. Yeah, so he shot the plane, the interior of the plane. And then, as you see, he built he built a set where the seats, and, you know, where they had the actual seats and all that stuff sitting there. And he photographed the people for it. So it was stripping in all the different people, stripping in uh, sky through the windows, adjusting the lighting, getting the color effects and stuff they wanted. You know, so yeah, that was a real fun project. The guy with the drumsticks, uh, there was another version where he's holding up a glass of wine, but when it runs in the mid east, they couldn't show alcohol in the ads. So they had, uh, had to have alternative versions where there was no alcohol. Ah. Uh -huh. Wow. So lots of shots done just to provide this. Yeah. Yeah, there was another one where, where you could see the carpet uh, in the aisleway, and we had to lay a design down on the carpet because they didn't have the right carpeting. Wow. Well, this one, this, this one really caught my eye. It's so subtly done, but it's really nicely done, Dennis. Well, thank you. Thank you. The photographer for that is... Uh, a guy Bob Stevens and he's been shooting top auto ads for for decades um, and we've become good friends for this so uh, this was something he was shooting for Lincoln and uh, you know um, this was this one was fun the balcony area up there we had to recurve recurve it move it around so it kind of fit the angle he wanted for that and then strip in different exposures to the car uh, for that. And then, uh, you know, they had the thing when you, when you press the uh, button to unlock the car, it lights up that little light on the, uh, yep. on the ground next to the car. 
Yeah. So how bright should that be? We had a lot of discussions about about how bright that little Lincoln thing should be. Yeah, very subtle, very nicely done. Thank you. What's your what, What's your favorite? What other than the movie posters? What What should we show as your favorite before and after? My favorite before and after. Well, one of the things that I, I really enjoyed, if you um, is the girl in the casino. So if you if you scroll down, this one the this one, the um, uh, the photographer was Roger Hagedon. And this we had like six images we were creating for this. It was a uh, series of ads for Grand Vitesse Casinos, GVC in in uh, Chicago. So everybody's arms were up in victory for the V mm -hmm. for this, and he photographed the backgrounds in the casino. But they obviously weren't going to shut down the casino and let them take over a whole area and shoot the stuff. So he shot the uh, backgrounds in the casino really quickly. And then came out here to LA and he shot the models in a studio. And I was on set with him, he's shooting the models, just making sure the perspective was set up right. And then uh, we were assembling all the, all the images together and it had a lot of creative input on how to make this really you know, come together. And it, it, the job wound up working out really nicely and um, wound up winning a, uh, uh, was it uh, some gold Addy Awards, something like that? Oh, nice. Um, for that whole campaign. So so that was a lot of fun. Well, you know what my favorite part of this is? What? That you remembered the wine glass. Oh. <laughs> you got everything upside down and repeated in the wine glass. Well, that, that, yeah, that, I think he had the table, um, the table was stripped in later, but I think he had photographed that, um, that on, with that background there. So the thing I did have to do is I had to add a reflection of her in the wine glass. Yeah. And that was fun, figuring out how to, how to make that work and look right. But I think that reflection was a happy accident. I think the part you liked best was was probably photographically there already. I'm glad it was there. See, we all become so jaded in <laughs> this business. <laughs> like, yeah, he put that together. I bet he forgot to reflect. Oh, nope, they're there. <laughs> uh, excellent, excellent. So, what are you working on now? Um, right now I'm I'm in between projects. So, so looking for what the next thing was. I had bid on some um, lifestyle shots that somebody sent me. Uh, they had a big rush for and haven't heard back from. So I figure either I bid too much or they decided it wasn't such a rush. Well, there are, it's always a rush unless something that comes up like a vacation or, you know, yeah. dog yeah. sick or something. Yeah. Yeah. One, one thing I'm, one of the projects I'm going to work on today is uh, sort of like a research project but it's something i think would be fun a uh, photographer friend of mine from edmonton renee robin i don't know if you're familiar with her work she does some really cool like fantasy fashion type stuff and she had posted lately about uh one of the shots she did uh this um dark-skinned person wearing like a white angel outfit so you know a woman in a white dress and white wings and she was saying you know it took her four hours to mask this thing out and, and masking out the white feathers against the white background was really hard. Like, Renee, send it to me. Let me see what I can do. See if I can come up with a faster way of doing this for you. For that. And then maybe we'll write an article about it. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. so that'll be, that'll be a fun challenge. See if I can, see if I can show Renee a faster way to, to tackle her difficult masking. Well, that some of the, um, some of the tricks that you use, oh, no, that, that, that brings me to, um, uh, uh, Final question, sort of something here. Uh, question about technique, anyway. Do you have special proprietary things that you've built for yourself, little actions or that type of thing that that you work with, or you is it pretty much always pretty much a custom deal going in every time? Uh, you know, one of the things about being a a freelancer, where my my workflow means I have to be really flexible, so. Most of my work is from my studio, 
Well, like last year, I had uh, several stints where I go work in house at one of the ad agencies on movie poster stuff for you know four or five weeks at a time. And so I find it's really important for me to be really flexible and not dependent on a particular set of tools. You know, if I had a masking program that I really loved, and I go work on you know go work in house somewhere, and their security team says we're not letting you install software on this computer, well then it'd be sunk. So I have to be able to use whatever Photoshop's got to make it work. And I find that actually, you know, lets me be really, really flexible in that sense. So I'm not dependent on a particular tool or custom set of tools or whatever for that. Um, you know, you just learn the basics really well. And every now and then I'll, I'll experiment with something. Um, like I remember back in the day, we experiment with some of the uh, masking programs. I would always find that I spent two hundred dollars for this masking plugin, and I could do it faster and better myself. But sometimes, every now and then, you reverse engineer, like, "Oh, that's what's going on." Okay, now I know the principle, and I can do it with just a basic set of tools now. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. it's you know, and a lot of the solutions for this stuff, you know, it's I, I find part of the fun thing about this is there's sort of that Zen process. Um, it's really more about the workflow. And I get in and I, I tackle the stuff that's obvious first and then go to the next harder thing and the next harder thing while the really difficult challenge sits in the back of my mind. And by the time I get there, an answer has popped into my head. So it's, it was that thing like with the uh, Jack Black post. They're like, how are we gonna make this work? Like, oh wait, suppose I try this. You know, so it's it's, that kind of a process. So everyone is sort of a custom thing when you have a, a, a challenging image. And that's part of the fun thing is figuring out what that solution will be. But you're reconfiguring the same basic set of Lego blocks over and over again. Well, that's basically what we end up doing anyway, isn't it? Solving problems? Oh, yeah. We, uh, we solve problems. That's what we do. That's this whole business. I tell my, my, tell my students, um, if you can't solve problems, you can't be a commercial photographer. This business isn't for you. This is all we, all we basic, the reason they're hiring us. I mean, if they could run it through a filter, they'd run it through a filter and be done with it. So it's great to have you here, Dennis. First time we got a chance to uh, chat a little bit. I'm getting an internet instability. Are you still there, Dennis? Oh, we lost Dennis. Oh, what a pain. We lost him. Let's see if he can reconnect here in a second. If not, Dennis, I want to thank you so much for, for being out there. We're going to stare at Dennis's frozen face for a second. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, and uh, have a great one, my friend. I'll see you later.